speaking to you from the Syrian border on the eastern slope of Mount Hermon, Har Hermon and the Golden Heights. Let me explain exactly where we are. That is the official border of the United Nations ceasefire zone, the no man's land, with Syria on the far side and Israel on the near side. We're speaking from a Druzy village. The Jews are a sect that are not Muslims. Although they speak Arabic, they're loyal citizens of Israel serving in the military and so forth, but there is a Druzy community in Syria as well as in Lebanon. But the Syrian government policies will not allow communication between the Syrians who are Druzies and the Israelis who are Druzies. Families are divided. You can see them literally yelling across the border because the Syrian government will not even allow telecommunication. They ask things like, has any babies been born in our family? Has anyone been married? Has anyone died in our family? Because they just don't know. There's no direct communication allowed by the Syrian government. Hence the Druzies literally yell across that fence as loud as they can trying to exchange news with family members because of the policies of the Syrian government. Directly on back of us, where I'm pointing is Har Hermon, Mount Hermon, certainly the Mount of Transfiguration, where the Lord Jesus would have walked with Moses and with Elijah, where Peter wanted to build three booths. This is the opening sequence in the first chapter of our book on the rapture entitled Harpezo, and this is exactly where it took place on Mount Hermon, directly on back of us. We're at 8,000 feet. Mount Hermon is approximately 10,000 feet. The transfiguration of Jesus on Mount Hermon is where we have the clearest picture of the rapture and resurrection. Moses, a man who died faithful to God, Elijah, a man who never died but was raptured, meet the Lord Jesus as it were in the air, the highest point in Israel, where Lebanon, Galilee, and Syria come together on top of Mount Hermon, Har Hermon, snow covered five months of the year. Even now it is very cold and breezy, even though we're at the beginning of Israel's summer. Looking down this way again towards the Syrian border, there are Israeli military monitoring posts immediately to our right, which we're not allowed to film. The military police will obviously not allow us to do that. However, you can frequently hear shooting and explosions coming from the Syrian side of the border. There have been many victims quite close to Israel, and Israel has accepted from all camps and from all communities victims of the combat for emergency medical surgery and treatment, something ignored by the international media. These include Arab Christians, Druzies and rival Islamic sects pro and anti Assad regime. It also has included Iranians. Right across this border is where the combat has sometimes reached and it is ongoing sometimes on an almost daily basis. It is here we begin this week in prophecy. Iran has been the hidden player and sometimes the more obvious player. It has animated much of what is going on in this area of Syria. Republican Guard elements from Iran have actually reached this border right across from where we are looking. They have usually used surrogates, but Iranian Guard units have managed to get to the border and evoked an Israeli response. In one of the responses, Israeli airstrikes have managed to kill an Iranian general, taking place right across this border from where we are presently looking. This has been ongoing. Now we have to understand Iran's agenda. Iran being Shia are backing Assad because he is a member of the Alawite Shia sect. There is a religious component to this as opposed to what is happening with the Sunnis. Much of what is actually taking place in Syria is a civil war with Islam between Sunnis and Shias, akin to the war between Iran and Iraq in the 1980s. This area from where we are speaking is of tremendous biblical importance. The contemporary events that are transpiring in the news and in prophecy are taking place where so many important events happened in biblical history. If you just look to where I'm pointing, on back of that mountain is a valley, a gulch, and to the east of it, not very far, is the location of what was is the Damascus Road, where St. Paul would have been knocked off the horse and converted on his way traveling in a north by northeasterly direction towards Damascus. 
As we have stated, Mount Hermon is the site of the Transfiguration. It was not Mount Tabor, as is alleged by Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholic traditions. It could not have been. If we read the Gospels carefully, it had to be Mount Hermon, Har Hermon. Something else transpired here, though. It goes way back to ancient history, according to the book of Jared. It is where the Nephilim came down, as recorded in the book of Genesis, chapter 6, and procreated with human women in a demonic attempt to count the to uh, corrupt genetically the human race to prevent the seed of the woman from coming and bringing redemption. Now Jesus was emphatic, just as it was in the days of Noah. What happened here on top of this mountain with the Nephilim will in some way be replayed eschatologically and prophetically in the last days, but this is where it originally happened. It's spoken of not only in the book of Genesis, but also referred to in the New Testament, in the epistle of Jude, and that is a alluded to in various other biblical passages, but we have the historical record of it from the book of Jared right before us on Mount Hermon. Looking again at this week in prophecy, the player becomes Iran and its designs. What Iran is attempting to do at the very moment we're speaking to you is to establish two corridors. One corridor would branch off from the other in northern Iraq, south of the region that is the Kurdish provinces of of Iraq, south of Turkey. They would then fork and split with one going into eastern Syria, coming through the north side of Damascus and proceeding across the Shuf into Lebanon, where the Iranians would have a direct corridor to supply and to back and to arm and, and to uh, replenish with munitions for Hezbollah, Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, hence creating a front to attack Israel from the north. The other would be right before us. It would come to the south side of Damascus, right up to the border below us, where the Iranians, with their proxies, would be able to threaten Israel directly up the Syrian border here in the Golan Heights. So there would be two fronts, one in the north and one in the northeast. That is the essential strategic design of Iran. In this, they have a de facto backing of Mr. Putin. He is essentially cooperating with the Iranian aims. The other friend of the Iranians in achieving these aims was Barack Obama, who released over $150 billion in frozen assets to Iran, which they are presently using to purchase weapons from Mr. Putin in order to kill Americans in Afghanistan and elsewhere, and to continue their jihadist aims against Israel. This was all courtesy of Barack Obama. If there was ever a president who should have been impeached, and some would say put on trial for treason, it was certainly Barack Obama, who has done anything and everything he can together with John Kerry to enable the Iranian aggression against Israel, but also against the United States, both in enabling their or in de facto terms, allowing the nuclear proliferation, but in financially giving them the wherewithal to accumulate the arms and munitions they need for waging jihad and is radical Islamic terror backed by Iran. Again, thanks to Barack Obama, who wrote the check. In this area, directly below us, we have had not only forces opposed to and supportive of the Assad regime, we've had Russian military advisors, we've had Iranians, we've had elements of ISIS and of Al-Qaeda. This is how close they have reached Israel, right to this border directly below us. It would have been from this area below us and slightly to the north where the Syrian rocket attacks on Israel would have been launched that were taken out by the Israeli arrow missiles that are capable of taking out even smaller projectiles such as Katusha's. Again, these weapons were provided via Iran but manufactured in Russia, yet they were not able to penetrate Israel or Israeli airspace significantly. They were taken down by the Iron Dome defense system and the 
Arrow missile technology jointly developed with the United States. The guidance systems for the Iron Dome at this particular point are situated on back of us up on Mount Hermon and off to my left, but we can't photograph them again, but it's exactly where the guidance systems were. The missiles would have fallen in this area, going off to our right towards Jordan, but this is where the firing would have actually come from. The Israelis responded, of course, with airstrikes, and the airstrikes would have taken place in the area just slightly to our left, but before us on the Syrian side of the border, not very far at all. The explosions would have been heard from inside Israel. The smoke would have been visible from here on the slope of Mount Hermon. What the Iranians are essentially doing is what the Russians are doing, poking, poking, poking. You're seeing rather antiquated Russian bombers approaching Alaska, then turning back, Russian ships coming close to American naval vessels. Well, the Iranians are doing the same thing with small gunboats coming within a thousand yards of American naval vessels in the Straits of Hormuz at the entrance to the Persian Gulf. They poke, come close, pull away. Americans go on alert, prepare to fire, but nothing seems to happen. Here on the Israeli-Syrian border, however, things do happen, and the Israelis always return fire. This past week, the Syrians claimed to have downed an Israeli fighter jet. The Israelis deny this. This would have taken place, again, in the foreground just before us, in Syria, somewhere between where we're standing and Damascus, whose outskirts are no more than 16 miles from where I'm standing. That is how close Damascus is from the Israeli border here in the Golden Heights. This is a very, very intense area. The Israelis, as we pointed out last week in Prophecy, bombed the area around the airport that was used in the shipping of Iranian weapons bound for Hezbollah and Lebanon. The claim that one Israeli plane was shot down was vociferously denied again by the Israelis. But there is a probable deployment of the Russian S-400 uh, anti-aircraft missile system. Uh, the Russians use Syria as a testing ground for its latest hardware in actual combat situations. It would appear, however, it has not been working as good as its claim to be, but again, we don't know exactly for sure. A more advanced Soviet anti-aircraft system, the S-500, is under development and it is claimed will be superior. It is always a technological battle with the Americans and Israelis needing to technologically re-innovate to keep up with the anti-aircraft measures that the Russians provide via Iran to Syria, and it's all taking place right before us. But now let's look even further at this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, something that would have been unimaginable 10 years ago, or even 5 years ago, transpired. We now have a public schism, a falling out between Hamas in the Gaza Strip and Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. Because of the Sunni-Shia divide, there has always been something of a problem in their relationship, but because of the common enemy Israel, and because of Iranian willingness to arm both Hamas and Hezbollah, there has been a kind of political cooperation. Interestingly, though, they never really worked in strategic cooperation. When Hamas was attacking Israel on the south, Hezbollah never attacked on the north, and when Hezbollah was attacking on the north, Hamas never attacked on the south. It was always a political cooperation. It was never really fully a strategic one, except in very limited terms. Again, this is partially related to the politics of the Sunni-Shia divide and certain other factors. Nonetheless, let's understand what's actually happening. When Yasser Arafat was alive, the Palestinian Authority, which was the successor of the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, essentially pilfered and plundered. They swindled, embezzled most of the international aid given by Europe, America, and others to build infrastructure in the Gaza Strip schools, roads, hospitals, etc. The money was essentially embezzled and stolen. This motivated people in Gaza, in their frustration, to switch their support to Hamas. Hamas, however, diverted the aid to military construction and to funding terror against Israel, which they called continuing the jihad. 
Hamas had a civil war in Gaza against the Palestinian Authority, and with Iranian backing, it came out on top. This was not the first time there was a civil war among the so-called Palestinian Arabs. And in their civil wars, they kill a lot more of each other than the Israelis ever kill in self-defense, but the Western media is reluctant to report that. There was a terrible bloodbath in Lebanon, Palestinian against Palestinian Arab, but what took place in Gaza was even worse. Now, however, Hamas wants to make a play for the West Bank and to either circumnavigate or if possible ultimately displace Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. Hence they are making a diplomatic move that many are decrying. They have appointed a new political chief this week in prophecy. His name is Ismail Hania. He is a major figure in the con- in the uh, He's been a major figure in the conflict between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas in the past, and he's a political enemy of Mr. Abbas. They're actually beginning to talk about the possibility of some kind of a recognition of Israel's right to exist in very hypothetical terms. They're doing this to groom the sympathies of the European left and of certain people in America certainly in the hope of getting more international financial aid, which they can apply to their own purposes, but also for propaganda purposes at a strategic time. What is the time? The time is the advent of Mr. Trump's arrival in Israel within the next next two and a half weeks and his upcoming visit to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. In anticipation of these events, they've begun to make a move. This move has also included a distancing itself from the Muslim Brotherhood, mostly based in Egypt. Now this would appear to be a moderation in their traditional jihadist position, but we must understand something. They follow the doctrine of tahwid, the Islamic doctrine of tahwid, permissible lying. When they lie to the infidel, it's not seen as a lie. It's simply seen as military disinformation in the jihad. They use the term salim when they talk to the West, peace. But when they talk to each other, they use the term in Arabic, hudna, a temporary ceasefire until we can get the strategic advantage. And I have a question for you. If I understood you correctly, you said a bit ago that you support any Muslim doing the work of a Muslim. Can you describe exactly what you mean by the work of a Muslim? Yes, I believe that uh, Islam is submission. And that applies to every aspect of our life, whether in our relationship with our families, our relationship with society, even the way that we address people and invite them to Islam. Jihad is not something which, you know, the Muslims are permanently engaged in. But there is jihad to liberate Muslim land, which is an obligation for the Muslims to support verbally, financially and physically to liberate and to defend our life and our property. And of course, this is something, you know, the Muslims around the world, I don't think will differ with. They may say one thing to you in front of CNN, but I can assure you behind your backs, in every massage, in every, in every community center, they are standing with their Muslim brothers and sisters saying, we hope the Americans and Britain, Brit- British are pushed out of our countries and we can implement the Sharia. So this is an Islamic obligation for us. When Israel withdrew from Gaza unilaterally for peace, it was Hamas who simply continued to use Gaza as a platform to continue the jihad, launching terrorist attacks and Katusha attacks against Starot in the outskirts of Tel Aviv. This has been ongoing. This is their basic strategy. But there are enough left-wing people who, who are naive, anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic, and impervious to any recognition of the real realities of the way that terrorist organizations like Hamas work, who will undoubtedly buy into it and speak of it with some favorable mention and begin politically pressuring Western governments to respond to these uh, overtures by Hamas. This is not well advised. It's a typical game, and it's not the first time Islamic forces have played this game, but the game is being played now. It has upset a lot of people, not simply heightening the schism or broadening the schism between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas, but also between Hezbollah 
and Hamas, as well as the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas. But its timing is orchestrated to coincide with the approaching visit of Mr. Trump. This is what is happening this very week in prophecy. In anticipation of Mr. Trump's arrival, the White House and the American State Department have stated that Mr. Trump is stipulating that for there to be any progress in reviving a peace process supported by the United States and the United States influencing Israel to the peace table, that there must be a cessation of the funding and the paying of stipends to the families of terrorists who are in the West Bank by the Palestinian Authority. That the kind of teaching in the school curriculum which champions the memories of suicide bombers, naming schools, public institutions, public monuments after suicide bombers who've killed Israeli civilians, both Jew and Arab, that these things are expected by the Trump administration to stop as a precondition to any peace initiative being revived. With this arrives Jared Kushner, Mr. Trump's son-in-law, in whom Mr. Trump has expressed some confidence in his negotiating ability, despite a lack of diplomatic experience, as far as anyone is aware. This is quite interesting in that he is Jewish. He would not, however, be the first American Jew by any means to attempt to resurrect the peace process between Israel and the Palestinian Arabs. Madeleine Albright was Jewish and attempted to do this, and of course so was Henry Kissinger. Nonetheless, we know that the Antichrist will somehow have a Jewish identity in some sense, and he will bring a false peace to the Middle East. We are not saying that Mr. Kushner is that or anything like that, any more than Madeleine Albright or Henry Kissinger was. We just say it is interesting and it is something to keep an eye on. Uh, the Antichrist is the only one who will bring a false peace to the Middle East ultimately. It will be the Lord Jesus who will bring a true and lasting peace. Now, with Mr. Trump coming and the prospect of negotiations being revived, Hamas, which has been isolated, wants a place at that table. That is why this past week in prophecy, it has been ameliorating its position, trying to outflank Mr. Abbas as the sole spokesman for the Palestinian Arabs. It is imperative that we understand the only real differences between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas have been that one is Sunni and while the other is mainly Sunni it has had a closer alignment with Iran that being Hamas that is the chief difference uh, but other than that it's simply a power play between two factions that have a very similar ideology the Palestinian Authority however groomed by Yasser Arafat has been much more skilled at deceiving the West and at playing up to the Western media pretending to be on a peace crusade when in fact what they say to their own people including Yasser Arafat himself before his death saying jihad, jihad, jihad repeatedly as bombs were going off at school bus stops throughout Jerusalem and Tel Aviv uh, is that they do the same things as Hamas but sing a different song. This is the only real difference. Well, now Hamas is learning to play the same game. Hamas said what it was and did what it said, while the Palestinian Authority said one thing and did another. Now Hamas is beginning to imitate them, wanting a place at the table, and again, wanting more political leverage in the West Bank. That is basically what is transpiring this week, and it's quite interesting indeed. Let's continue looking at this week in prophecy. The State Department and White House also announced that Mr. Trump will be visiting Saudi Arabia and having direct negotiations with the King of Saudi Arabia, whose regime is less stable than many people imagine, and who are somewhat quaking in the shadow of the Iranian threat. Mr. Trump is interested in negotiating a mega arms deal again with the House of Saud, who are the de facto government of Saudi Arabia. These people are, of course, Wahhabists. They are Salafist Islamists who are pro-Sharia and who fund Islamic extremism globally. While you cannot bring a New Testament into Saudi Arabia, they fund the proliferation of 
pro-Sharia mosques, schools, madrasas, etc., and other Islamic institutions throughout the Western world, including the United States, and do so with the blessings of the American government. We are drawn back to the words of George Bush Sr. The Saudis are our friends. Again, as I've said before, a regime that will behead people for being Coming Christians may be a friend of Mr. Bush, but he's no friend of America, certainly not Christian America. The Bush administration, both of them, and certainly people like Dick Cheney and James Baker, did nothing but pander to the, so- to the Saudi Arabians, even in the aftermath of the September 11th attacks, withholding from the public the involvement of key members of the House of Saud, that is the Saudi Arabian government, in what happened on September 11th when most of the hijackers were from Saudi Arabia, and the Bush administration continued the <coughs> express visa program to bring in more Saudi Arabians for a full year after September 11th. We can say safely, without exaggeration, that the House of Saud, who funded the radicalism that resulted in September 11th, carried the Bush White House around in their back pocket. Uh, James Baker, as general counsel to the Carlyle Group, in which the Bush families are financial partners and investors with Saudi interests, uh, represented the Saudi Arabian government against the families of September 11 survivors who tried to litigate for damages against the Saudi government. But again, Baker was on the side of the Saudis against the American families who were the victims of September 11th and who lost loved ones. What do you expect from establishment Republicans? However, this kind of policy was continued by the Clintons. Uh, Hillary Clinton alone with the Clinton Foundation received $25 million from the women's rights, from the human rights, from the Christian rights violating Saudi regime. Uh, And, of course, it was continued by Barack Obama. That goes without saying, except Barack Obama even more so pandered again to the Iranians. We've seen one betrayal after another. We had had the hope that this would begin to change with Mr. Trump. So far, it really has not changed too much, even though he will use the term Saudi terror. The Saudi government, again, will not allow bringing a New Testament into Saudi Arabia. I know I've been there. But that did not stop George Bush Jr., George W. Bush, from putting a Koran given to him by the King of Saudi Arabia in the White House Library after September 11th to honor Islam. It was the Bush family who began celebrating Ramadan in the American White House. I would like to know if the King of Saudi Arabia would receive a New Testament from an American president and celebrate Christmas or a Christian holy day inside the Royal Palace in Riyadh. The answer would of course be no, but those things mean nothing to to the political whore class that runs most American administrations of both parties. Uh, What do you expect from a prostitute except for a prostitute to behave like a prostitute? Well, a political prostitute like Bush is no different, or Obama or Clinton as the case may be. But there was a hope that Mr. Trump would be different. This week, however, CAIR, the Council of American Islamic Relations, three times its senior officials were cited by the Justice Department and the FBI as unindicted co-conspirators in the funding of terror, yet the organization is allowed to continue to exist simply because of the political influence of the Saudi Arabian government in the United States. It has its front men like Mr. Zogby and Mr. Cooper, indifferent to the fact that they're demanding the same kind of rights for Muslims in the Western world and in America that the Islamic world and the Islamic countries that fund them, like Saudi Arabia, denied to Christians, Jews, and others. Again, they have rights, we don't. Well, this week, they demanded the removal of an American military instructor who was teaching counterterrorism because of the way he spoke directly about the reality of Islamic doctrines of jihad. They've also demanded removals of police department training programs and even certain textbooks that they found offensive to Islam. How can you defeat an enemy that you're not allowed to describe? Now again, so far, Mr. Trump has really not done anything about Saudi Arabia. He's not even released the 28 pages of documentation linking 
them or showing their involvement to the events that preceded September 11th. This is most discouraging. Again, it's early days. We're looking to see what Mr. Trump will actually do. Please pray for him and for Mr. Pence that he will not sell out to Saudi Arabia for money or for oil money the way preceding administrations have. We understand the reality of needing Saudi Arabia on our side against Iran, but that should work both ways. It should be reciprocal. Uh, and so far it has not been. We've always called for the CAIR to be investigated by Congress and to be closed down as an organization whose senior leadership has been linked to Islamic terror. It needs to be closed down uh, on the grounds of national security. Nonetheless, this is what is happening this week with Mr. Trump and his relationship with the Saudi Arabians. In Israel, there is a high expectation as to what Mr. Trump will do concerning his promise to relocate the American embassy to Jerusalem. Will he do it or will he break the promise? That remains to be seen. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. It is my prayer and my hope that Mr. Trump will keep that promise and relocate the embassy, at least its main headquarters, where the ambassador's office will be, to Jerusalem. That's what he said he would do, and it's a reasonable expectation for him to keep his word, not only to Israel, but to the Christian supporters who are supportive of Israel, who voted for him. We shall see. He's coming in two and a half weeks. If we just go back a half step. Okay. Ready? Another curious news item was released in the international press this week as well, and on internet, and it made front page news here in Israel, but was downplayed in the United States as just more rhetoric from North Korea. For the first time significantly, however, at least with any major amount of focus or emphasis or amplification, the North Koreans have threatened to punitively rain destruction upon Israel. They are thousands of miles away from Israel. They're not an Islamic country. They should have no agenda. But North Korea has exported any weapon it has ever made. And it has exported them to rogue states for state-sponsored terror. And now, of course, they're on the precipice of attempting to get a nuclear capacity as is Iran. But North Korea this week actually threatened to destroy Israel. That's quite a thing. Whether or not this relates to the kings of the East, many people will have many views of that prophecies in the book of Revelation. Nonetheless, it has not gone without notice here in Israel. Something else transpired this week in prophecy. Okay. Continuing looking at this week in prophecy, something else transpired. Germany is again behaving the way Germany did in the 1930s. We warned last week it was a German court who exonerated Muslim attackers in Germany of a Jewish institution of any hate crime, saying it was politically motivated against Israel, even though it was a Jewish target. Again, Germany going back to being Germany. It was not an anti-Zionist act, it was an anti-Semitic act. <coughs> Nonetheless, a German court said otherwise. Under Angela Merkel, who I like to call Eva Braun Merkel, she wants to allow one million Syrian refugees to come in from Syria to Germany. A million. Among them are many radicalized elements, they've admitted it. There has obviously been ISIS infiltration, Al-Qaeda infiltration, but this means nothing to Angela Merkel. Again, she is no friend of Israel. What she did this week was the following. She led the European contingent in the United Nations to support the UNESCO resolution invalidating any Israeli claim to Jerusalem and its environs as the indigenous people playing into the hands of an alien people, that is, Islamic Arabs. The United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. Well, it is not educational. 
It is propaganda. It is certainly not scientific because it rejects the scientific confirmations of archaeological discovery that show the Jews to be the indigenous people. As far as culture, it supports the culture of jihad. It supports the culture of Islamism. 57 Islamic states in the UN representing its biggest contingent to whom Angela Merkel is prepared to kneel down and lick their boots. Um, and that is exactly what this woman is doing. Despite the Islamic attacks in Munich, Paris, south of France, and in Brussels, doesn't mean anything to her. The question is, why are these Arab Muslim refugees not going to the oil-rich countries of the Persian Gulf and Saudi Arabia? Why do they want to come to Europe to have the German taxpayer pay for their social benefits? Why do they want to come to the United States? Why aren't they staying in their own region with their own culture, their own religion, and their own language where oil-wealthy Muslim Arab states can take care of their own instead of exporting them to Europe, America, and the West? This is a very good question that the mainstream media does not wish to answer, but it's a question that needs to be asked and certainly should be answered. And if anyone should be made to answer that question, it is Angela Merkel. Nonetheless, this is the reality of what this terrible, terrible woman is doing. She's an absolutely terrible woman. We see Germany returning to its 1930s past that led up to the anti-Semitism that predated the Holocaust. Quite a situation. An attack on a Jewish institution and the German courts say it was not a hate crime. Uh, it was only a political statement against Zionism. Uh, there's been public films, footage released on internet, on YouTube, showing these Islamic refugee gangs groping and sexually assaulting German women at Christmas time in public squares and at Christmas pageants in the streets of Germany, saying they have a right to do so because the women are infidels, again with the de facto blessings of Angela Merkel, who wants to let this continue. Well, France is going to be ruled by one woman or another. If Mr. Moron is elected, it'll be ruled by Angela Merkel, who, like Mr. Moron, will pander and continue to pander to radical Islam. Or it will be ruled by Marine Le Pen. The problem with her being Le Front National, the National Front, and its anti-Semitic history. It is a lose-lose situation for Israel, and as we looked at last week, it is responsible for the large influx of French-speaking Jews coming from Europe into Israel at the present time. But these things gain momentum, this very week in prophecy, courtesy of Angela Merkel and the United Nations, whom I prefer to call the United Nothing. That is what took place again this very week. Now we have to understand something. It was Hitler and Himmler, and we have not only photographs, but copies of telegrams, where they were supportive of Arab efforts to destroy the Jews in the 1940s. Hitler, Himmler, they met with the Mufti uh, Husseini of Jerusalem, uh, again, commending and being in express support of his efforts to stop the Jews. Uh, it didn't, of course, work. There was something called the Palestinian Legion, except there were no Arabs in it. The Palestinian Legion was constituted of exclusively Jewish soldiers, 30,000 Zionistic Jews who put on their British uniform, pledged allegiance to the monarch of Great Britain, and fought under Field Marshal Montgomery against the Nazis, 30,000 on a voluntary basis in a combat in a combat brigade. This was the Palestinian Legion without a Palestinian Arab among them. Hitler took the side of the Palestinians. The British at that time took the side of the Zionists, until, the, of course, the white paper was then withdrawn, placing Israel in a very precarious situation. Should they continue to su support the British, or should they simply stand alone <coughs> or fight the British? Israel was put into a horrific situation in Great Britain, most particularly by the Labour Party. Nonetheless, the situation continued, and it's continuing until this day. Theresa May following through on this policy, 
was the stooge. She was the gopher for Barack Obama's last official act as president when he put the dagger in the back of Israel in the UN vote from which the UN abstained but Great Britain at the behest of Obama voted against Israel. This was most most troubling and again had it not been for Mr. Trump I believe God's judgment would have come on America as a result of it but beware his judgment is still going to come against those who curse Israel and who pander to Islam, an Islam that persecutes Christians. The Germans also had an acute interest in placating the Iranians, the Persians, because Hitler was very, very interested in anthropology, knowing that the Iranians are Aryans, that is, their anthropological first cousins of the Jews. And he saw them as a potential ally, not just against the British, French, and Americans, but against the Jews. That was always Hitler's idea from the beginning. And we see again, rapprochement policies within the European governments led by Germany wanting to somehow try to befriend Iran instead of taking the radical stand that they need to. Now again, this is not simply the Europeans. Even when the United States had its naval personnel illegally apprehended and taken captive by the Iranians, allowing America to be humiliated, John Kerry thanked the Iranians for being gracious to the Americans as the Americans knelt there with guns pointed to their heads and their hands on top of their foreheads. This was John Kerry's reason to thank Iran. Fortunately, with Mr. Trump, this kind of humiliation of America and the West has come to an end, but the future is still very much in play concerning Iran. We will see what happens, but beware that what was happening this week in prophecy concerning Iran is undoubtedly related to the prince, that is the principality of Persia, in Daniel chapter 10, a demonic power that Satan will try to use to destroy Israel in the last days. In light of last week's This Week in Prophecy, we looked at the role that Turkey has increasingly played in uh, northern Iraq and in eastern Syria. And again, it is not difficult to construct a scenario that would very much, very much harmonize with a Gog and Magog battlefield situation as recorded not in the book of Revelation at the end of the millennium, but another Gog and Magog in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. Again, we're not prepared to be definite or dogmatic concerning it, but it does seem that that could take shape very, very easily. Now, the Iranians have made these gains into Syria in a clever way. Being Shia, they're opposed to Sunni, and because ISIS is Sunni, the Iranians came in as allies in the war against ISIS. But once you enter northern Iraq, it is easy to come into Syria and to support the regime of Mr. Assad. Again, their real aim are the corridors. One ending in southern Lebanon at the Mediterranean, the other ending right under our eyes, right under where I'm standing at the border with Israel here at the Golan Heights. These things are happening right where I'm pointing, at the fence right beneath us. That is how close the Iranians have reached Israel. But let's understand how the Iranians actually operate. And so we see the stage being set, not just for the return of Christ, but what will precede it, the coming of the Antichrist. As the Lord Jesus returns on a white horse, the Antichrist will first come on a white horse, misrepresenting himself as a man of peace. But he will not be that. We see in Europe now the Brexit negotiations. Britain and Germany coming to loggerheads, trying to make the iron stick to the clay. Greece demanding some kind of debt relief again from Germany. The iron, the strong countries led by Germany, trying to make the clay stick to the iron, even though they do not naturally adhere. I was reading this past week the writings of Irenaeus, the last living link historically with the apostles through the line of Hegesippus and Papias. Irenaeus had been a disciple of Polycarp, who got his doctrines directly from the apostle John at the end of the first century. And Irenaeus said the apostle John taught Polycarp and the other 
disciples who were alive at that particular time that when you see the iron trying to stick to the clay it'll be the countries in the Roman Empire that will come down to a final ten that will be the sign the Antichrist is about to be revealed and we will know him by his name and the number of his name uh, he proposed three possible solutions for what the name could be but he was not dogmatic about it nonetheless he did say the apostolic understanding was it was Europe and it would have ramifications of course for the Middle East and so we see this week in prophecy it is indeed transpiring it is indeed happening but we also see that a constellation of forces all inimical to Israel certainly with the participation of Mr. Putin and Russia but we see Syrians both anti-Assad and pro-Assad forces we see Al-Qaeda we see ISIS and above all we see elements of Iran and they've all reached that fence now let's understand this a bit further because of the Sunni Shia divide and the influence of the Muslim Brotherhood Iran had influence but not control over Hamas as it did have control via Syria over Hezbollah in southern Lebanon now that is beginning to change of course because of of Syria but Iran generally works by proxy it works by proxy via Hezbollah to a degree it has worked by proxy by Hamas at least until now and it works by proxy mainly by proxy in Syria there is a large diasporic Palestinian Arab population in Syria that is funded by Iran and recruited into Iranian backed trained and armed militias there are other Alawite Syrian forces that are in religious militias sympathetic to Iran ideologically due to religious reasons being Shias there are other forces aligned with Iran also active that are more smaller and independent all inside of Syria but Iran is pulling the strings and they reach this fence right beneath us exactly in line with what Daniel chapter 10 tells us was going to transpire again how much longer can it be how much longer before the Lord comes how much longer before the Antichrist shows his hand and the faithful church will come to understand who he is when he attempts to bring a false peace and it would appear unite the forces of the north against the kings of the south against the more radical Islamic threat of the south or so it would appear quite a situation but it's all happening not a week goes by that we do not see things taking shape and coming into configuration with the paradigm prophetically the Word of God gives us all of these things have been happening this very week again we urge everyone to pray for the peace of, of Jerusalem Shalom Shalom Yerushalayim to pray for Mr. Trump and for his visit to pray for the governments of Germany and Britain that they will stop cursing Israel and pandering to the Islamic world and to pray for the believers of the Middle East who are facing increasing persecution continually this week in prophecy I'm sorry to say that here in Israel Orthodox Jews have wrenched up their persecution of the Messianic Jews now in the, the town of Damona small city in the Negev desert uh, the believers are undergoing violent threats and persecution harassment in their homes from the Orthodox as Yeshua said you will not go to all of the towns and villages of Israel until the Son of Man comes please pray for the local believers in this land as they endeavor to bring the good news back home again and proclaim Yeshua as Messiah in his own land to his own people of one thing we may be sure they will not finish the job before he gets back that same Yeshua that walked here up on Mount Hermon will again walk here Moses will be with him Elijah will be with him and because he died for our sin and rose to give us eternal life and because he is able to keep us faithful 
We too shall walk with him. Peter wanted to build the booths, but couldn't. But when Jesus comes back, those booths will indeed be built. The nation shall celebrate together with the Jews the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem, Zechariah 14. It's getting closer and closer. Week by week, every week, we see things lining up increasingly. I'm not an alarmist. I don't become sensationalistic. I simply look at what is actually happening in light of prophecy. And it is very, very clear that the Lord is indeed coming soon. How soon, we don't know. But the prophetic significance of these events that surround us are absolutely undeniable. That is this week in prophecy. Have a great week in Jesus' name.